Hi, this is Junaid, Neurocritical Care Stroke and Epilepsy Specialist. During this time of the year, I always get requests for the review of their personal statements. So I thought it would be best that I could create one video that explains what the concept behind the personal statement and really the mindset behind it. You have to understand residency is both a training opportunity and a job. So for example, if you were applying for a job anywhere in a corporate America situation, what would you write? You would write a cover letter. In that cover letter, what you're describing is something that is not on your CV, that is not your hard skills, that is something that you are who as a person and why you want to join that particular company as an employee or a, you know an executive, whatever. I personally, thankfully, have not have to write a cover letter, but I review a lot of them. And I understand that when you are writing a cover letter, the most important thing I'm personally looking for is the information that is not included in the CV and more importantly, that who that person is, at least from his own eyes. So that's very, very important. One page that defines you in the context of that company corporation or job. So people extremely take care of that particular portion that is training but does not consider job as a part of the overall mindset when they're applying for their personal statement as well. So it is all about subjective quality. It is all about soft skills. It is not objective. It is not about hard skills. That's what your CV is about. This is basically a one-page summary that who you are as a person, what is your purpose, what is your passion. So it is a story about you. Very important, it is a story. So you actually have to write it in a way that within one page that summarizes you as a person rather than as a professional. Huge difference. It summarizes you as a person, not just as a professional. So the key components are these three things. What is your purpose in life? Why do you want to do something? The second thing is, what is your passion? What do you want to do? And who you are? So when these three things combine into a story in a context of the subspecialty or a specialty you're applying for, that is your personal statement. So one of the most important things is to understand what not to do. And then, you know, we can come to what to do. First and foremost, it should not be more than one page. Times New Roman 12 phoned and that's it. If it's longer than that, to be honest with you, I'm going to lose interest and therefore it has to be compact and should not be more than one page. Do not regurgitate your CV. As I said, this is in addition to your CV. A person who's reviewing this is generally going to review both. Sometimes they're going to review the personal statement first or the CV first. For me personally, I look at the CV first and decide if I would really want to know the person or not. So for me, first the CV qualified and then once he's qualified, now who he is. So therefore, in general, if you're going to regurgitate your CV over there, then I'm going to say, what is this redundancy? So do not regurgitate your CV. Second biggest mistake people do is that they also put in a paragraph, why medicine? I mean, it's generally sort of known. Clearly, you're now a doctor. I mean, you're a freaking degree awarded physician. So I don't really need to know why you went into medicine. What I need to know is why do you want to get pursue this particular specialty or subspecialty? So therefore, it is very important, especially in internal medicine, because there's a huge, humongous amount of subspecialties that are available. You basically talk about more about subspecialty as well. At least that's my recommendation. People have different recommendations. But in general, you need to talk about that rather than why you became a doctor. So that's very important. And definitely avoid silly mistakes like grammatical errors, spelling mistakes, etc. Because this is your first foray in that person's mind who you are. So if you're going to make mistakes in that particular document, then it's really a bad, bad first impression. So the structure is, you know, defined in, in my opinion, in these five sections. Number one that people do is defining moment, then why the subspecialty, what, who, job, and things. So let's go one by one. So defining moment is sort of optional. This is some, most of the people start with the first paragraph and sort of define like a defining moment in their life, a story that they share where they actually truly became physicians or at least thought about becoming physicians, basically highlighting compassion, trust, human interaction, connections, etc. In my opinion, this is a more of an optional, but it is a good start in some ways. Either you start from there, but again, try to tie it to section two, because it's if you're just going to do it that, you know, I'm going to have a defining moment, well, well, then what? So therefore, it's very important that you actually tie it together to your subspecialty or specialty of choice. And that is the key thing. Now, why you're going to choose a subspecialty is extremely important. And that's why you have to actually tell the person that why you're interested in it. I'm going to give example of neurology because clearly I'm a neurologist. But more importantly, I think you should avoid cliches. 
like you know especially let's say radiology tumor diagnosis is the first thing right oh my aunt was had an ovarian cancer radiologist swooped in and then you know won the day by creating a diagnosis period or same thing with neurology like there's at least 50 to 60 percent of the personal statements that i've read is all about neuroanatomy or localization in neurology which is truly one of the key important things but at the end of the day it is becoming a cliche so avoid some of these cliches if you can i think more importantly to concentrate on in this day and age is to show maturity about how you understand the subspecialty and subspecialty in the first place like for example in neurology i would recommend that you know it is the final frontier of research i mean you can get an artificial heart an artificial liver an artificial kidney you know dialysis whatever that case may be but you cannot get a brain transplant right i mean otherwise my wife would be in line first it is cutting edge in research there's a complete spectrum of practice that you can do you can do hyperacute in neurocritical care and stroke to all the way to outpatient and chronic palliative neurological care so you can say that you know you like that about neurology or there is clearly new evidence coming up in the market and this is something that is cutting edge well so therefore you want to be in that you know area where there is continuous scientific development that is helping the patient so that's one thing that you can actually say lastly i personally think that neurology still can be practiced in a resource limited avenues and this would be great for value-based care that is sort of the buzzword of the decade is you know with your clinical acumen you can decrease the burden of cost by decreasing you know imaging etc etc so talk about those things that tells you a little bit forward thinking in as far as why you chose the subspecialty as compared to just regular run of the mill. The next one is when you have talked about that subspecialty, then you have to talk about what that subspecialty entails. Let's say neurology. Again, unfortunately, that would be a lot of neurology examples, but here it is. If you're gonna talk about it, then you have to talk about like, in neurology, you need to be detail-oriented. You have to be agile. You have to be a good learner, etc. And these are the four, three, five things that you are actually need to be a good neurologist. And then you tie those qualities to your personality, preferably with examples. So for example, if you're gonna talk about compassion, dementia, and you're going into that, then you can talk about your personal experiences, even with your family members. If you're gonna talk about research, you can, same thing, right? I mean, you're just looking at a newer medication that is released and you're th saying that, you know, finally we have, you know, crossing some barriers for providing better therapies for patients that was not there before. Or you are very detail oriented in the sense that, you know, you have this mind in which you can, you know, spot tremors or EEG, rhythm changes, etc., which is extremely important for neurology. So the idea is you highlight some of these attributes that the subspecialty needs, and then you tie it to yourself and say, I have them. So therefore, I'll be a great neurologist. So that's the real portion of this section that you have to hone in. A few things that you have to really remember is there are three things that we really care. Number one is demonstration of hard work. Number two is compassion. And number three, team player. So anytime there is an example of team player, a multidisciplinary team, et cetera, it's extremely important. So make sure that if there is one example that highlights a team player spirit in you, that is extremely important and that's very valuable. People forget that. You talk about, as I was talking about, evidence, final frontier and all that. But one key thing we're looking for in a residency applicant is, is he or she a team player? The next thing is talk about the job itself, right? I mean, you are still applying for a job. Don't forget that. So you have to say, I'm looking for a program that actually mentors me in these particular arenas that I'm very, very hopeful to continue further down the research. For example, I'm looking for a program that fosters innovation, that fosters research because I'm going to continue my career as a clinical scientist or I'm looking for a program that is heavy on inpatient services because I'm going to hopefully follow up with my career as a neurocritical care neurohospital specialist. I'm looking for a program that is great in neurophysiology because I want to create an excellent neurophysiology I don't know, lab back in Pakistan, India or Bangladesh. Who, who knows? But the idea is that you still sort of hone into a job a little bit describing the program that you're interested in and why it ties back to you. Again, it's a personal story. It's a personal statement. It's a story about you. It's always tied back to you that how do you want to approach this? So a little bit of that is extremely important. And then the last section is thanks. What is thanks for at the end of the day? What is that the person did to you that you should be thankful for? First and foremost is it gave you 
his or her time to actually review your personal statement. So you have to actually thank them that you took the time to review my personal statement and CV and if we want to tie it together to you, one of the things that I would always appreciate is the last thing is that you are a lifelong learner. You are looking for mentors that will teach you, educate you, and you will return the favor. And one of the things that I will be proud of as a teacher and has always been a proud of as a teacher is that one of my pupils or students or anything actually carries on the torch because that's the only only to be honest with you, we're going to go into other sections later. But what I'm trying to say is that that is the only big thing that I get off personally as a purpose while I'm doing the teaching, that my student actually carries on the teaching. So that would be the sort of the last conceptually line that, hey, thank you, grateful for the time. And you will find me as a great learner, as a pupil, and you'll be proud of me to call me a student, a trainee, or etc. So that would be some ways to actually finish up the letter in general at the end. What is the true process? First of all, the first and the foremost is read, read, read. Go online, search, read a ton of examples and go call your seniors who have written last year's personal statement, get all of them and then constantly read, 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 read. Not to copy them, but to get sort of an overall structure, ideas, storyline, etc. Then write and rewrite and then rewrite and then rewrite and then rewrite. You have to rewrite again, again and again. One of the things that you have to be very sure, like people send me like all these for review, I never generally comment on the content. I always say that, hey, this is your person as a personality and everything. And I can say more about the structure. Hey, you need to include a little bit more neurology, radiology, hematology, whatever you are. But I never say that, okay, write this content, right? This is such a personal thing that you have to come up with your own story. But it's important that as a sections that I developed, you should actually follow them. And then if you really need help, professional help, as far as grammatical errors, spelling chess, etc., then you should sometimes even get professional help or someone in your family and friends who is actually good at English writing should definitely review for mistakes and everything. So lectures like this, including many more ERAS applications, CV building, etc., are going to be part of the upcoming course that I'm doing with Danish Bhatti, a guide to getting into residency in the US. The whole idea is to decrease the cost and time and improve your odds. So make sure you check out academy.aineurocare.com for regular updates. One of the other courses, Decide Wisely, a guide to choosing a medical specialty, that is for medical students more so, that particular course will be available soon as well. Thank you. If you save a life, it is as if you save the life of mankind. Please make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel and my newsletter. If you want to get in touch with me, the best way is to go through Twitter or via LinkedIn. Also make sure you follow the Academy website for regular updates. Thank you so much.